Vayamos. So good afternoon and thank you all of, uh, for attending this webinar. Today we have the webinar of the Protein and Structure and Function uh, Group. Uh, this group was uh, coordinated by Carlos Fernandez Tornero. Uh, uh, he, he, he can't uh, attend today the, the webinar, uh, but I want to really uh, thank him for his contribution during these years to, to the coordination of the group. And I, I also want to welcome Maria Jose Sanchez Barrero, that is going to be the coordinator of this group during the next uh, two years. So welcome, Maya Jose, and thank you for organizing uh, together with Carlos this, this webinar. And if you want, you can uh, now uh, introduce the, the our, speak, our speakers today. Thank you. Thank you, Mar. Um, so it's a, a big pleasure to me to start a uh, um, as a coordinator, and I would like to thank first Carlos for the transition, and I'm very happy to to welcome today Carmen San Martin, our first speaker. Um, she is a MS and PhD in physics. Um, he worked on cryo uh, on electron microscopy uh, during uh, her PhD uh, together with Jose uh, Carazo, and also she uh, very interesting. Uh, she also compatibilized uh, 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 this training, uh, working as a support staff and technical manager at the Electron Microscope Facility at Severo, Severo Choda Center, who, which I really believe that helped her a lot to, you know, to be a super uh, controller of electron microscopes. And so she then, after her PhD, she moved uh, to Wistar Institute at Philadelphia uh, work, uh, to work with Roger Burnett. Uh, uh, in the States, and um, as she was supported with EMBO, Human Frontiers, and the Spanish Ministry of Education um, uh, money. And, and then she came back to Spain first as a junior group leader at the uh, National Center for Biotechnology, CSIC, and then she consolidated her career here as a scientific titular. And she um, and her group investigates the structural and physical determinants of complex virus assembly, focusing on adenoviruses, pathogens, and therapeutic vectors. And today she is going to talk about uh, plasticity of capsid proteins across the adenoviridae family. Thank you, Carmen, for, uh, for being our first speaker. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you, Maria Jose and Mar. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh -oh. Okay, so um, hopefully now you can see uh, the presentation. And uh, let me just go uh, quickly to the first slide. This is a summary of what we do in my group. We are interested in understanding how complex virus particles assemble and how then they can disassemble when they enter a new host cell. And to deal with this problem, uh, we uh, use mainly electron microscopy uh, in all its flavors from looking at uh, uh, infected cells in resin sections, all the way to cryo-electron microscopy and solving structures at high, high resolution. We are also uh, using other techniques such as atomic force microscopy. This is not something that we do ourselves. This is a collaboration with Pedro de Pablo at the uh, Department of Physics of the Condensed Matter in the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid. And with this technique, uh, this is very interesting because here we can measure the mechanical properties of uh, individual virus particles and also to uh, use the atomic force microscope to simultaneously induce an uh, image, the uh, sequential disassembly of individual virus particles. Anyway, today I'm going to focus on this part of our work, the work where we use uh, cryo-electron microscopy to solve uh, high-resolution structures of adenovirus particles. Um, uh, when we think about adenoviruses, usually the first thing that comes to mind is that they are uh, vectors. We use them to express proteins uh, uh, in cells, or uh, they can be used as therapeutic vectors. For example, this is an example here 
from the New York Times coronavirus vaccine tracker, uh, where you can see that early during the development of vaccines against the SARS-2 coronavirus, there were already several uh, vaccines based on adenovirus vectors that very quickly became approved for use in different countries. And actually many of us have received uh, a vaccine based on either human adenovirus 26 or the chimpanzee adenovirus. Um, Adenoviruses, however, uh, are also pathogens. They do not have a very large clinical relevance in healthy individuals, but they are one of the main causes of diarrhea in children and in uh, patients with uh, problems with the immune system, such as patients having undergone an organ transplantation, they can uh, cause very serious disease and even they can be fatal. And we have actually um, no, uh, no efficient treatments to cure adenovirus infections. Adenoviruses are also pathogens in uh, animals of economical importance, and they uh, can cause serious economic losses, uh, in particular in the poultry industry. So this is the current taxonomy of adenoviruses. They are grouped in six genera, and they have been isolated in all kinds of vertebrates from fish to humans. And one of the lines in my group uh, is the line that uh, tries to answer this question. What makes different adenoviruses different? Why do some adenoviruses infect fish and other infect humans? And of course, we have an underlying question here, and the underlying question is, can we find adenoviruses in nature that help us to improve the efficiency of the adenoviruses currently used as vectors? So what makes different adenoviruses different? The first thing that uh, makes them different is their genome. Adenoviruses uh, are double-stranded DNA viruses, uh, the genome, uh, ranges in length between the different genera uh, from 26 to 45 kilobase pairs. Um, they have uh, several tens of uh, open reading frames in these genomes, around 40 uh, in general. And um, what we can see in uh, when analyzing the genomes is that uh, all adenoviruses share a common core of genes here uh, depicted like uh, black arrows. And um, this common core of genes contains genes um, that code for proteins uh, required to make new adenovirus particles. This includes uh, proteins involved in genome replication, such as the polymerase, uh, proteins involved in genome packaging, proteins that form the capsid and are involved also in capsid maturation, such as the protease. And then we have some exception that I... Um, have highlighted here in, in red. And these are called genus-specific structural proteins. These are proteins that form part of the virus particle, but uh, they are specific of uh, each individual uh, genus. So uh, to answer this question, what makes different adenoviruses different, since we are a structural biology group, we look at uh, the architecture of uh, the virion of the virus particle. And this is uh, how an adenovirus particle looks like. Uh, they are uh, non-enveloped icosahedral viruses, rather large. They have a diameter from vertex to vertex of about uh, 100 nanometer. Uh, T equals 25 triangulation number. And uh, the mass of the virus particle is about 150 million Dalton. Uh, for people working in cryo-EM structure, to give you an idea of this size, I will uh, show here that Usually in cryo-EM, uh, we are using box sizes of around 1,000 pixels uh, inside. And these are large boxes, and we are uh, usually um, limited to a very uh, moderate sample rate, 1.35 angstrom per pixel. If we go to uh, thinner uh, sampling, uh, we are starting to find computational problems in the computers, and the GPUs cannot deal with these very large boxes. And then once we have the 3D map, uh, we need to trace and analyze over uh, 13,000 residues in the asymmetric unit. And each particle has 60 asymmetric units because it's psychosahedral. So um, how is uh, the adenovirus particle uh, built? Um, most of the capsid is composed by the major code protein, hexon, here, as you can see in this 
uh, hexagons making the hexahedral facet. Each hexagon is a trimer, and the monomer uh, has a fold uh, called the double jelly roll fold. This fold is characterized by two uh, um, jelly rolls, two beta barrels, um, positioned in an orthogonal orientation with respect to the capsid surface. So down here, we would have uh, the genome, and out here, we will have the solvent. And these towers are the uh, most exposed part of the capsid. So we have 12 of these trimers forming one facet of the icosahedron. Then at the vertices, we have the penton. The penton is composed by two proteins, penton base, which forms a pentamer. And this pentamer also has a jelly roll, a single jelly roll down here. So we have the pentamers here. And on top of this pentamer, we have the fiber. The fiber is a trimer. So we have here um, a symmetry mismatch, a trimer uh, assembled on top of a pentamer. And these proteins are involved in receptor binding. And actually, this is a model because uh, these fibers are usually flexible and we cannot see them in single particle uh, average maps. Uh, so all we see is the penton base and a little stump here of the shaft. And this part, the head of the fiber and the upper part of the shaft has been solved by crystallography of recombinant proteins, but there are no structures for the complete shaft, no high resolution structures. Now the hexon and the penton based structures are conserved throughout all the uh, known adenoviruses. And this makes sense because these are the main bricks that are needed to build the capsid. The less conserved parts are here in yellow and red, and these are the surface loops. The fibers are also conserved up to a certain point. The fold of the head is conserved, but uh, there are adenoviruses with different uh, length of fiber and even different number of fibers. And the variability of these proteins and these loops in the surface makes sense because they are involved in interaction with the host, receptron binding, uh, interaction with the immune system and with the host defenses in general. And so they are subject to uh, high evolutionary pressure. So they tend to have a large variation between different uh, types of adenoviruses. Um, but this is not all. Hexon, penton, and fibers is not all that we need to build an adenovirus particle. We also need what are called the minor capsid proteins. Here, for example, we have proteins 3A, uh, 6, and 8. And these are located on the inner capsid surface, as you can see here in this cartoon. These are present in all adenoviruses known to date. They are conserved in all genera. And today I'm going to be talking mainly about proteins 3A and 8. I'm not going to be talking about 6. Then um, on the outer part of the capsid, we have the decorating decoration proteins. And uh, for example, in human adenoviruses, we have one of these genus specific proteins, which are only present in the mastadenovirus genus that includes the human adenoviruses. And this protein 9, as you can see here, makes a kind of hairnet weaving around the hexons and um, helping to keep the capsid together. So uh, for the first part of my talk, I'm going to tell you a tale about the external minor code proteins, about these decorating proteins. Um, so protein 9, as I said, is present only in mastadenoviruses, and it is involved in helping to stabilize the capsid. Uh, how does protein 9 look like? This is uh, the structure of human adenovirus type 5. Um, protein 9, as you can see here in these tiny bits of blue, uh, you can see a little bit of 9, but most of 9 you don't see because it is buried in these dark valleys uh, beneath hexons. So I'm going now to remove the hexons to show you how 9 looks like. Um, uh, this is 9 in human adenovirus type 5. This is the most studied adenovirus. And this protein has an amino terminal domain here that is called the triskelion domain because three copies of protein 9 uh, get together at these structures to form a triskelion shaped uh, domain. Then we have the rope domain. And this rope here is in dashed lines because this is uh, generally disordered and usually it's not, uh, it cannot be traced in high resolution maps. After the rope domain, we have uh, the carboxy terminal domain that forms an alpha helix. And these alpha helices in the human adenovirus type 5 capsid form a four helix bundle. 
In this bundle, three helices come from copies of nine from the same facet, and the fourth copy comes from a copy of nine from the next icosahedron facet. So in the helix bundle, we have we have three helices in a parallel fashion, and the fourth helix comes in anti-parallel fashion. So you can see that this is a, a very uh, complex network that protein 9 is making here. In non-human adenoviruses, this rope domain is very, very short. It practically doesn't exist. And what happens is that uh, the helix forms, instead of a four helix bundle, we have a three helix bundle right on top of each triskelion. So we don't, do not have this interaction between copies coming from uh, different uh, monomers. So um, from all this uh, collection of uh, known adenoviruses, there are over 200 different adenoviruses found so far. Uh, the most studied are, of course, the adenoviruses involved in, in therapeutic vectors, uh, such as, for example, these ones are the ones used uh, as vaccines, as COVID vaccines. So at some point, we decided to start looking at other adenoviruses, that adenoviruses that had not been so well characterized. And we started by looking at human adenoviruses causing gastroenteritis, the enteric human adenovirus 41. So, um, as I said, hexon penton are conserved. The difference we found here is in protein 9. In protein 9, in the enteric adenovirus, we could see the triskelion. We could not see the rogue domain that was expected, but we didn't see the carboxy terminal alpha helical domain either. All we could see was weak density uh, here in blue, uh, making us think that there might be a helical bundle there, uh, not on top of all the triskelions, but only on these peripheral pink triskelions, not in the center one. And this uh, putative helical bundle must be flexible or disordered so that when we average uh, and impose the ecosahedral symmetry, we cannot see it. Uh, but using these weak densities, we could propose a model for the organization of protein 9 in the enteric adenovirus. And what this study told us is that the organization of protein 9 in the human enteric adenovirus is different from either the non-human adenoviruses and the uh, human adenovirus type 5. And why is this organization different? We are not sure, but what we can see is that there are tiny differences in the sequence, both in protein 9 in the rogue domain and in the hexon uh, residues in the periphery of hexon. And possibly the small differences in nature in these uh, residues makes the, this flexible rope domain to interact in a different way so that it, in the human adenovirus type five, uh, the rope domain rotates in counterclockwise direction. However, in the enteric adenovirus, even if it is long enough to go to the edge, as here, it never goes to the edge because it follows a completely different path. And in this way, the four helix bundle uh, cannot be formed. So after this, we decided to look at even uh, adenoviruses even farther away from the therapeutic vectors. And looking for adenoviruses that could be propagated in the laboratory, we found adenoviruses infecting reptiles. And we studied uh, snake and lizard adenoviruses. Um, so, uh, what is special about these adenoviruses? Uh, the reptilian adenoviruses belong to the adenovirus genus, and in this genus we have, uh, we do not have protein 9, but we have an additional decorating protein uh, called LH3. And this is uh, genus specific for the adenovirus genus. And this is how this protein LH3 looks like. Uh, this is the human adenovirus, and this is the lizard adenovirus. And you can see that LH3 forms these prominent knobs on top of the hexon towers. And this is the most exposed uh, element now in the reptilian adenovirus capsid. Now, in, if we look at the structure of LH3 in detail, we can see here, this is now a side view in here, down here would be the genome. This is protein night that I showed you before for the enteric virus and the human adenovirus type five. Here we have the triskelion, the disordered rope domain, and the four helix bundle. In the reptilian adenoviruses, however, we still have the triskelion in exactly the same positions as in human adenoviruses, but the rest of the protein is completely different. This protein, instead of forming a helical bundle, 
uh, falls uh, in which, what is called a trimeric, uh, trimeric beta helix. And this trimeric uh, beta helix is a fold typical of bacteriophage receptor binding proteins. So we have here a bacteriophage tail spike on the surface of a eukaryotic virus. And the interaction between this beta helix domain and the surrounding hexons, as you can see here, is uh, very strong. There are lots of interactions. And uh, we think this is the reason why these uh, reptilian adenovirus capsids are more thermostable than the human adenovirus type 5 capsids. An interesting bit here is that uh, the study of this structure together with analysis of the genome uh, suggests that reptilian adenoviruses at some point uh, picked up this gene from bacteria and then this gene was duplicated and one copy evolved to keep the triskelion but lost the beta helix domain and became protein 9 in the human adenoviruses. The other copy lost the triskelion so it lost the ability to bind to the capsid. But this uh, beta helical domain uh, uh, is still there in the genome of human adenoviruses and is now a non-structural protein. It is actually an oncoprotein involved in destabilizing the cell cycle during the infection. So this is all I wanted to tell you about the external uh, minor code proteins. Uh, I now move to the second part of the talk, the tail of the internal minor code proteins. And uh, here I go back to the, these conserved proteins, and we will start by looking at protein 3A. 3A, as I said, is present in all the genera, and it is required for genome packaging. It is located underneath the, the vertex. You can see here, this is human adenovirus type 5, seen from inside, from the point of view of the genome. And we have here beneath the vertices, these yellow proteins are protein 3A, making this kind of pink wheel. And then we have uh, the other minor code protein, protein 8 in orange here. And you can see there's one copy near the center of the facet and another one interacting with 3A beneath the vertex. Okay, so um, this protein 3A forms this kind of ring beneath the penton in the human adenovirus. In the lizard adenovirus, we also have protein 3A making a ring beneath the penton. But the uh, conformation of these proteins is different in the two viruses. As you can see here, they overlap very well in the amino terminal part, which is the part that interacts with the penton. But the carboxy terminal domain is in a completely different uh, location in the LISA uh, virus. And when we look at the environment, the penton, protein 3A, and protein 8, we can see that because of this change in conformation, now the interactions that keep together the, the vertex region are very different in the human and the reptilian adenoviruses. So uh, we wondered why is this protein, if it is conserved, why is it so different? And we found that in our cryo -EM map, we had some extra densities where we could not assign sequence, but we could trace some uh, alanines here. And we see that we have an additional protein making an additional ring beneath the, the, the penton. And it is here depicted in, in purple. Now these viruses on top of LH3, um, we know that they have two additional uh, genus specific proteins in the capsid. And we know this because we analyze these purified viruses by mass spec to to see their molecular composition. Now, we think that uh, this density corresponds to either one of these two uh, genus specific proteins. And because this extra protein is there, uh, protein 3A cannot occupy the same position as in the human virus because it would uh, clash, as you can see here, with this genus specific protein. So when we uh, finished this study, we were very happy because we thought we understood that in the reptilian adenoviruses, we have an, uh, a different decorating protein on the outer surface, reinforcing the capsid stability. And we have a genus specific uh, internal capsid protein inducing a large conformational change in protein 3A. And everything seemed to make sense. Um, then we decided, let's try to go a little bit farther away from the human adenoviruses. And we started looking at avian adenoviruses. In avian adenoviruses, the genome is very, very long. It is 25% uh, longer than in the human adenoviruses. And they have lots of genus-specific proteins. So we thought, okay, they must have also some 
uh, genus-specific proteins in the capsid, uh, uh, similarly to the reptilian adenoviruses. So we sent these viruses to MASPEC, and the surprise was that there are no genus-specific proteins in the capsid, no decorating proteins at all on the outer surface. However, these avian adenoviruses are highly thermostable. They can withstand temperatures up to 10 degrees higher than the human adenoviruses. And also because uh, we found no genus-specific proteins in the capsid, uh, the hypothesis was that protein 3A would be organized as in the human adenoviruses because there are no extra proteins bothering it and uh, hindering it, uh, its position as in the human adenoviruses. So what did we find uh, uh, for protein 3A? This is protein 3A in human adenovirus. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, this is supposed to be a movie. Yes, okay. This is the chicken adenovirus, the fowl adenovirus, and in pink, the lizard adenovirus. And you can see that our hypothesis was wrong. Uh, we have in the chicken adenovirus no extra proteins uh, inducing this conformational change in 3A, but 3A is more similar to the reptilian adenovirus uh, than uh, to the human one. And actually what we see is that the fold is really the same. If I play the video again, uh, what happens is that is that the carboxy terminal domain here um, rotates, swings around this long helix here to adopt a different position. But the fold is practically the same in all the three viruses. And um, incidentally, I want to uh, show you here our experience with alpha-fold in predicting the structure of this protein. This is the prediction. According to alpha-fold, they would all adopt the same conformation. However, this is the experimental data. So this is one of the cases where alpha-fold still cannot deal with what happens with these proteins in uh, their biological context. So um, this is all about protein 3A. Uh, let's now look at protein 8. What happens with protein 8? This is protein 8 in human adenovirus type 5. It forms this kind of uh, uh, gun, if you want, right? Uh, gun shape. And we can trace the complete protein except for 45 residues here. And this protein, uh, these residues, we know that they are cleaved by the uh, adenovirus protease during maturation. They are in the virus particle, but they become disordered, so we don't see them. So this is again the human adenovirus protein 8. This is the lizard adenovirus protein 8. As you can see, uh, it is very similar. We have a slight uh, change here where we lost this uh, small, uh, this small uh, beta sheet, and instead uh, we have some alpha helical structure here. And this is now the foal adenovirus protein 8. And you can see that it is completely different. They all have this gap here because of the uh, maturation cleavage. Now, what we see here is that the adenovirus, the uh, chicken adenovirus protein 8 is the most divergent from the three genera studied so far. And one interesting detail here is why is this protein so different? And if you look at this protein uh, together with the hexon, uh, to which it is bound, we can see that in the lizard or the human adenovirus hexons, the amino terminal region is shorter than in the chicken adenovirus. And so this amino terminal arm, if I now tilt the hexon a little bit, we can see that if protein 8 would fold as in the human adenoviruses, it would be clashing with the amino terminal region of the hexon. So, I told you before that when we studied the reptilian adenoviruses, we thought we had understood things about the capsid organization. However, in the avian adenoviruses, the capsid is more stable, but these viruses have no external uh, decorating cementing proteins. There is no uh, genus-specific internal capsid protein, but the protein 3A looks uh, more similar to the reptilian adenoviruses than to the human ones. And the avian adenoviruses protein 8 is the most divergent from the three genera studied so far. So one thing that happens here probably is that we are seeing the changes the, along evolution in these minor code proteins. We see that the avian adenoviruses are supposed to be more ancient than the reptilian and the mammalian ones. And so uh, presumably we are seeing changes in evolution or not. Why do I say this? Because uh, then we decided to 
come back to human adenovirus type 5 and study the structure of uh, the human adenovirus immature particles, the particles uh, where the proteolytic cleavage by the adenovirus protease had not uh, happened. So I remind you again, this is protein 8. We cannot see 45 residues here, and these residues, uh, this is where they are in the sequence. They are in the central part of the polypeptide. This is again uh, the mature protein. So uh, then Jose Gallardo uh, looked at the structure of immature adenovirus particles, and what we were expecting to, expecting to find was the same structure with some extra stuff for the 45 residues that were cleaved uh, by the viral protease, but in the immature particle, they should be there, they should be present. What we see is this. We completely lose the organization of this uh, amino terminal fragment here. The beta uh, sheet uh, has disappeared. Instead, we have an alpha helix here, and we have some bits and pieces disordered here and there. So uh, we are seeing that the conformation of these minor code proteins does not only change along evolution, it, only, it also changes during the morphogenesis of the virus, even if the sequence is exactly the same. If we compare the structures of mature and immature uh, protein 8 in uh, the human adenoviruses with the non-human adenoviruses, we can see that actually, um, oops, sorry, um, the fold of the immature uh, human adenovirus protein is more similar to the older adenoviruses. It uh, shares this uh, small alpha helix here. And what about protein 3A? Protein 3A also changes during uh, maturation of the human adenovirus. This is the mature protein, and this is the immature one. And this is the overlap between both of them. We can see how uh, after uh, genome packaging and maturation, this amino terminal region becomes ordered. However, uh, there is this carboxy terminal region that becomes disordered, and uh, we don't know where it went here. We uh, lose it. And with all this data, we have now this animation where we can see how, uh, in particular, the vertex region in the human virus changes during, uh, uh, during morphogenesis. We have here the immature particle uh, before packaging the genome, and now this is the mature particle. And you can see how uh, the conformation of protein A changes. It kind of kicks and invades the space for this extra domain of protein 3A, and this domain becomes disordered. And we uh, can actually assign the identity of the, um, the cleaved region of protein 8 uh, to this uh, little piece here uh, in reddish orange. So uh, all these uh, changes during maturation and packaging, as you can see, are changing the interactions uh, uh, keeping together the capsid during the morphogenesis of the virus. So, in conclusion, we have shown that adenovirus external decorating protein vary with species and genera. We see that adenovirus internal minor code proteins adopt different uh, conformations depending on the context, not only the particular uh, virus uh, genus or species, but also the particular maturation stage in the same virus. And this is a common theme in, uh, in virus capsid proteins, in minor capsid proteins, that uh, they use flexibility, presumably to accommodate the different needs for interactions between uh, the assembly and the disassembly of the virus particle and also the interaction with the host. And uh, as you can imagine, we still have lots of questions that we have not answered, uh, such as what is the role of these architectural differences in defining the host specificity of the viruses? How do all these proteins get together in the cell when the, uh, the new infectious particles are uh, built? And do these structural differences provide interesting properties for the biote biotechnological use of these exotic adenoviruses? So this is it. And thanks a lot to the people who actually did the work and uh, the funding agencies. And thank you all for your attention. Okay, oh. thank you. Thank you, thank you, Carmen, for uh, the such clear and interesting talk. And um, are there any questions from the audience? If you want, if you want to do questions, you can uh, write them in in the in the chat.
in the in the meaning time I, I have one curiosity Carmen I have many questions but uh, I am not from the field but I, I'm curious about the, if is, is there any correlation between the capsid stability and the infection capability of, of, of the uh, of the virus that, that's the idea. There must be some uh, some relation because, for example, we see that uh, the avian adenoviruses can withstand higher temperatures, and the body temperature of the birds is higher than in uh, the mammalian host. Mm -hmm. Also, some of these viruses uh, propagate via uh, fecal oral route, so they mm -hmm. have to withstand very harsh uh, conditions in the gut of the animal and then in the environment. So our idea uh, was to uh, find some relation between uh, the thermostability and the infection properties. But so far, uh, as you can see, we keep finding surprises. And when we think we understand something, then, then it's very surprising. We have to yeah, go back to- really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. And the stoichiometry of, of the internal conserved proteins is the same from one species to, from one type of the virus, uh, one and the other type of virus. Yeah, yeah. yeah, for these conserved proteins, it is the same. It yeah. is the same. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, okay. Car Carmen, I, I also have some questions while <laughs> people uh, 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 get into the asking uh, mm -hmm. things. So, uh, so it's almost 10 years now since the first uh, structure at high resolution. Uh, what do you think that it's been the biggest surprise in the field? And also, I can imagine that now that you have high resolution structures, uh, you or maybe the people in the field maybe are thinking about how to avoid the assembly of virus therapy yeah. for some plugins. That's right. I would say the biggest surprise that did not come from the capsid structure, but from the proteins that do not follow icosahedral symmetry. And I didn't have time to talk about those. Mm -hmm. But there are adenovirus uh, has a double-stranded DNA genome. And this genome is all the time throughout infection bound to uh, virus-encoded proteins that were thought to be <coughs> like histones helping to condense the genome. And mm -hmm. what we are seeing is that, yes, they do condense the genome, but they play many different roles during uh, this assembly and entry, for example. Mm -hmm. and this has been the biggest surprise. But actually, this uh, structure was solved in 2010 uh, before direct electron detectors, mm -hmm. still working on film by the group of Hong Shao in California. And at the same time, there was a, a protein crystallography group that also had high resolution data for the same adenovirus. And they nominally had the same resolution and they did not agree on where the minor code proteins were located. Actually, for a while, 3A was located outside of the capsid, which was a mess for people trying to modify the virus as a vector, as you can imagine. So uh, it's been difficult um, because most of these proteins, uh, they have large chunks that do not follow icosahedral symmetry. We have weak densities and we have many candidates to fill this density and it's, uh, it's been complicated. Yeah. <laughs> We have one question from the audience, from Natalia Martin Gonzalez. Uh, she asks, why, why do you think immature egg protein seems more similar to the rest of the genera? Is the maturation process occurring in all the adeno adenovirus genera? Hi, Natalia. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know why it's, it's more similar, but we can think that uh, this has... Uh, Changes on the inner uh, capsid surface, we can think that they are related to the presence of an additional DNA binding protein in the human adenoviruses, protein 5, which is not present in the avian or the reptilian adenoviruses. So, however, uh, having said that, we also know that there are mutants of human adenovirus that do not have protein 5 and the fold of protein 8 uh, doesn't change. So, there must be something else. And do all the adenoviruses undergo maturation? The idea is that they do because the maturation protease is conserved. But actually, these viruses are not very well studied. So somebody needs to start uh, characterizing this process also in the other adenoviruses. Yeah. Question, in that case from Jose Maria de Pereda Vega. 
uh, he says, thanks for the nice talk. Just a curiosity, is the confirmation of 3A proteins dictated by the interactions with the exon, or is something intrinsic of the 3A sequence itself? Um, we do not see many changes in the part of 3A that interacts with the hexon. So um, the thing is, this protein is about uh, 600 residues uh, large, and we can only trace close to 300. So there's a big chunk that is buried somewhere uh, together with the genome in there, and we don't see it. So uh, we don't know if this is uh, doing something to the organization of the rest of the protein that we see. And actually, if you try to predict disordered regions, uh, this carboxyl terminal region that we do not see is predicted to be disordered and to maybe become ordered uh, when it interacts with other proteins, but we don't see it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we have another question here in the, in the Zoom, in the chat from Zoom. Uh, and is from Carmen Mayoral Campos, and she says, hi, why do you think alpha fold is not able to predict the protein structure according to the biological function? Well, in this particular <laughs> case, uh, I don't know, <laughs> but I imagine that uh, in the end, alpha fold uh, also uh, drinks from the, from the sources, and the sources are the experimental data, and the experimental data available for a long time has been the human adenovirus proteins. So, uh, and many of these proteins uh, presumably fall in a different way, depending on the context, as I just said. So uh, I don't know what would happen if alpha fall is retrained now with the new structures. We need to see that. Yeah. Okay, so Mari, if, if there aren't any further questions, I think, that, um, thank you very much again, Carmen, for such a nice uh, talk, and we we uh, we welcome now uh, uh, Rafael Molina. I'm really happy to introduce him. Um, uh, um, he he is brand new uh, Ramón y Cajal researcher at Instituto uh, Instituto Roca Solano at CSIC. Um, Rafael uh, he did. Uh, uh, his master's degree and PhD in biochemistry. Um, the PhD uh, was supervised by uh, Juan Hermoso, and during that time, he was involved in understanding the mechanisms of, of virulence and pathogenesis uh, in bacteria. Uh, he, he has suffered the bad times of the Spanish science system, and uh, but he's been lucky enough to have a really extensive uh, postdoctoral experience at Tenio. And, uh, and also here at Roca Solano, uh, where he has gone a step further and, uh, and he's been working on the molecular basis of prokaryotic antiviral defense system. And um, thinking that uh, going abroad would be a good uh, choice to, to become a better researcher, he, he's been associate professor at Novo Nordisk Foundation Center for Protein Research. Uh, where we've been uh, getting into the CRISPR-Cas uh, system and trying to find an, a, a phage-based therapies or the development of new bi biotechnological tools. So thank you uh, very much, Rafa. He will talk today about uh, a ring to regulate it all, a CRISPR history. So thank you very much, Rafa. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. Okay, thank you, Marcos. Thank you for the for the kind introduction. Um, well, yeah, yeah the, the, the title uh, is uh, Ring to Regulate It All, a, a CRISPR history. And yeah, I'm going to talk about CRISPR because uh, I guess most of you are familiarized with this uh, uh, revolution around the genome editing tools and, uh, and are basically centered in these CRISPR tools. And, and uh, well, and I have title in this way because most of the processes I'm going to show you in, in the next slides are uh, centered uh, from a molecule which is called cyclic oligodenylate, which is the second messenger and is the, the, the leading molecule for, uh, for these uh, second processes in, in bacterial immunity. So this cyclic oligodenylate is basically a ring molecule. So that's why I have titled in, in, in this way. So, um, well, just, uh, you know, I guess most of you are uh, familiar with these genome editing tools. These are basically the fourth one. We are 
been using since the 90s. And uh, this CRISPR system is the last one, it's the most advanced one. But, uh, but okay, we started in, in, the, in, in the 90s with this thin finger nucleases, which was the, the, the first one for, for trying to modify the genome. And then in, the, in 2000, we started to work with the meganucleases. And in 2010, we, we uh, discovered these uh, talent ones, which are also from, from bacteria. And finally, in 2012, it was one uh, when the labs from Jennifer Don and, and Emmanuel Charpentier started to, to uh, demonstrate that we can use these uh, proteins or these systems for, for uh, genome editing applications. But I'm not going to talk about the genome editing application today. I'm going to talk about the fundamental research, let's say. And well, these proteins are basically uh, natural enzymes from, from bacterial immunity systems. And uh, as I have mentioned before, it was discovered in the late 80s by Francis Mojica, by our colleague in, in, in Alicante. And, and then in, in 2012, the discovery of this uh, system uh, was demonstrated that uh, from the lab from, from Jennifer Donald and Manuel Charpentier, uh, we can use this for, for you know, editing purposes. So basically this, uh, this system has uh, constituted a revolution in, in genome editing. And that's why they received this uh, Nobel Prize in Chemistry in, in, in 2020. Um, but what is CRISPR-Cas system? So this CRISPR-Cas system are, are bacterial immunity system. There are basically adaptive immunity systems. So we knew that uh, bacteria uh, contains this restriction modification uh, nucleases uh, constituting the, the um, inactive, uh, sorry, the innate immunity. And then we were uh, thinking that probably the adaptive immunity was just uh, from, from eukaryote, but it, this is not uh, like this because uh, in, in this uh, late 80s, we discovered that these CRISPR-Cas systems are also, uh, that belongs to, to bacteria are acting as an adaptive immunity system like in eukaryotes. And these systems are basically trying to fight against the, the, the plasmids, and viruses uh, that are attacking bacteria and, and archaea. Uh, from the um, uh, a mechanism point of view, uh, so it constitutes this CRISPR-Cas system are, uh, contains three different steps. So the first step is the, the adaptation step in which uh, basically in the first infection, the uh, bacteria is recognizing, is integrating the, the foreign nucleic acid in what is called a CRISPR array. Uh, this um, CRISPR array is like a record of, of, of previous infections. And then uh, this CRISPR array is uh, transcribed, uh, producing a CRISPR RNA, and then it's bound to the to uh, to an effector, producing the what is called effector complex, which is in the latest step, in the interference step, the responsible for triggering the the immunity response. It's basically the responsible of recognizing in a second infection the foreign nucleic acid and then uh, degrading the the the. Um, the external nucleic acid. So this is the way how it works, the, the CRISPR-Cas system. And, uh, but uh, we have to think about that these CRISPR-Cas systems are not just uh, unique. So there are uh, different types and different classes. They are classified in, in two classes, the class one and class two. Uh, the class one, uh, so the difference between them, it basically resides in uh, how is constituted the, the effector complex, so the responsible for degrading the, the, the nucleic acid. And uh, if uh, there is just a multi subunit effector uh, complex, is when we are talking about the class one. And then uh, probably you, you are familiarized with the case of the uh, class two, especially this Cas9 and CTF1, which are the, the classical one uh, we are using right now for you know, meditating application. And uh, in this case, the factor complex is just a single effector protein with different modules doing all the functions that uh, uh, is necessary for, for triggering the bacterial immunity. So in my case, I'm not gonna talk about this um, uh, class two. I will talk about an special class of uh, an special type, uh, in, uh, which is within the, the class one, is the type three CRISPR-Cas system because it's the only one along the, the, the different CRISPR-Cas system uh, which uh, can degrade not only the, the, the DNA, but also can degrade the, the, the RNA uh, from the external nucleic acid. So this is um, uh, an scheme to try to illustrate how it works, this type 3 CRISPR-Cas immunity. And uh, basically it's following the same steps that uh, I, I, um, I was telling you before about the, the three different steps, the adaptation step, then the expression step, and finally the interference step. 
And, uh, but in the case of the interfering step, uh, the difference is the factor complex is not only degrading, as I told you before, the, the DNA is also degrading the, the RNA, but it's even producing, the factor complex is producing a cyclic oligodenylate, which is a second messenger involved in many of the processes in the downstream of the bacterial immunity. So essentially is uh, activating um, RNases from the family of CSX1 and CSM6, is also um, uh, in this case in the family CSX1, CSM6 is degrading single stranded RNA, and uh, but it's also uh, this kind of cyclic oligodenylate are the activators of other proteins for, like the the protein CAN1, which is nicking the DNA supercoil and also uh, is uh, activating the NUCSI protein. Uh, which is involved in the, the cleavage of the double strand DNA. This is just an example because there are many other proteins involved in, in this response, but it's just to, to, to show you that this uh, second messenger, this cyclic DNA is fundamental for the, the, the second part of the response in, in, in this type three CRISPR-Cas systems. Even for example, uh, we have seen, and I will show you later on that uh, there are um, some viruses which are basically uh, degrading this activator degrading the cyclic oligodenylate to avoid the response on, of the bacteria. So uh, trying to be focused in this uh, uh, type three CRISPR-Cas system, especially in the interference step, uh, there are three different players involved in, 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 in this response. So basically we have the, um, uh, the RNases, and, uh, which are from the family CSM6, CSX1, and uh, which are activated by this uh, cyclic oligodenylate, and the oligodenylate is produced by these factor complexes. And then to regulate all these systems, we have an inactivator of the RNases from the CSX1, CSM6 family, with, which are called renucleases. This, this protein, these renucleases were discovered uh, like five years ago, and, and it has supposed uh, the way how the, the cell try to regulate the response of these uh, RNases, the action of these RNases, because if these RNases are uh, fully activated, the problem is that the cell enter into, into a abortion infection way and then introduce to the, to the cell death. So first of all, I will start talking about uh, what we did, trying to understand the molecular basis of the uh, decay of RNA decay in type 3 crispr system by studying the, the CSX1 uh, protein. And then what we did it was to try to solve the structure of this uh, CSX1 protein of these RNAs by X-ray crystallography. Uh, so yeah, after, let's say a couple of years, we finally started to, to see some nice crystals and this is the best one we, we obtained. And uh, well, we collected the data, the synchrotron obtaining this 2.9 Armstrong resolution, it was, uh, quite good, but uh, as many as you, of you know, probably we have in, in crystallography the problem of, of the phases. And uh, well, we, we have some strategies to try to overcome this problem, but in this case, it was not uh, possible. So we, we have to try to think in an alternative way. And at that point, we started to think that probably we can combine X-ray crystallography with cryo -EM data. And in this sense, probably combining the phases at low resolution from cryo -EM with the um, uh, X-ray data, we could uh, obtain the, the, the structure in, in, in high resolution. And then we, we started to prepare the sample for cryo -EM analysis. And by our surprise, we uh, obtained this 3.62 Armstrong reconstruction map. So it was uh, having a really high resolution. It was not a high in, in the case of the uh, crystallography, but it was uh, even higher than we were expecting. And then with the phases from, from this cryo -EM, uh, we, we combine it with the, the X-ray data, and uh, that was uh, uh, one of the information we obtained for, from the cryo -EM data. But the other information it was that we obtained uh, this shape of the of the CSX1, which is like a, a featured spinner. If you see, it's an excimer, and this excimer is constituted by a, a trimer of dimers. So combining this cryo -EM data with um, X-ray crystallography data, we obtain the, the, the structure of the CSX1 in, in its apple form at 2.9 Armstrong. And then uh, we started to analyze the structure. So if we uh, see here, uh, this uh, trimer of dimer, which constitute the excimer, if we take just the, um, the fundamental unit that should be the, the homodimer, uh, this is how it looks like. So we can see the, the place where we suppose is supposed to be bound the, the um, 
the activator, the, the cyclic oligodenylate in the upper part in between the two calf domains. And then we have also the place where it's supposed to carry out the catalytic activity in, in this bottom part. And also you can see here also the, um, the top view and the bottom view in, in, in this slide. And okay, we, this is the information from the, from the uh, Apple four. And then we were thinking, okay, let's try to see if we can get also the structure in complex with the activator and trying to, to map all the different, uh, if there is any kind of conformational chain or uh, if there is any kind of activity we can see after the binding of the, of the second messenger, the cyclic oligodendrate. So we incubate those crystals uh, that we obtain with, uh, uh, with the cyclic oligodenylate, with the, the, the second messenger. And then what we obtained it was that we could confirm the place where the, um, uh, where the ligand was bound. It was in between these two car domain in the upper part. You can see here the electron density map in, in the center in between these two um, uh, monomers. And, but not only that, because uh, what we see was that we obtained two different conformation of the, of the ligand, depending on the incubation time we use for, uh, uh, for trying to, to the timing we use for, for the incubation in, in, uh, within the crystals. So what we saw was that uh, when the incubation time was, uh, was, uh, uh, was not that high, we obtained this conformation one and, and longer exposure time to obtain in this conformation uh, too. And what this means to, to have this kind of conformation. So the only explanation we found it was that it should be related with them. Uh, it should suffer, let's say, CSS1, a, a, a conformational change uh, through the uh, changes also from the, the second messenger. And then uh, hope you can see the, the movie um, once the ligand is bound in the, in the uh, ligand binding side, and then it's uh, changing from the conformation one to the conformation two of the, of the ligand, uh, we were thinking that, okay, maybe uh, these uh, changes is also transmitting the signal from the top of the monomer to the bottom of the monomer. So maybe it is basically transmitting these changes is related with the transmission of the signal in the whole homodimer. And then as you can see here, this uh, the interaction in between the different domains in, inside the homodimer were changing, and this is, what this means is that uh, actually we have this transmission signal in, in the homodimer. And the other question was, okay, we have an excimer. It's also the, the excimer uh, affected uh, by this transmission signal. So this uh, signal transmitted uh, uh, through the homodimer is uh, also across the, the whole oligomer. And then what we did it was to analyze the structure of the examination. What we, what we call examination interface is basically the interface in between the different homodimers. And we try to, to analyze uh, if the, this interaction were changing from the upper form to the structure with the conformation one of the ligand and also with the conformation two of, of the ligand. And what we show it was uh, actually that there were many differences in, in, uh, in the interactions, in, in, in the residues interacting, there were different bonds changing and appear with basically uh, concluding that what we have is uh, a transmission of the signal within the homodimer, but also along the whole uh, excimer. So, um, but okay, in most of these um, RNAs, uh, CSX1, CSM6 family, uh, they are basically homodimers and we were not uh, understanding why we have in this case an, an excimer. And uh, okay, the only explanation we found is that it's supposed to be related with certain kind of cooperativity. So it uh, should be better for the cell to have this excimer being more efficient in, uh, in the cleavage of the RNA than in the case of, of just being a normal dimer. And then we perform uh, this uh, catalytic, uh, uh, this cooperativity assays to try to, to, to respond to this. And what we saw it was actually that this uh, heat coefficient 2.5 was uh, suggesting that what we have is a sequential cooperativity fashion way of, of, the, uh, of the function. So with all this information, with the apple form, with the crystal structure, with different conformation, with the ligands in all the activation and also all the different uh, cooperativity assays and biochemical assays, we could propose a model for the RNAs activation by this ligand. Uh, in such a way that basically when the first uh, ligand binding site is occupied by the, the second messenger, it transmits the, the, the signal from, from one homodimer to the other two homodimers. Then uh, there is a second uh, molecule of the cyclic oligodenylate binding to the 
uh, to the second site of the uh, of the cyclic oligodenylate binding site, and then this is also transmitting the signal to the other two oligomers, homodimers, sorry. And finally, uh, when the third molecule is uh, of the cyclic oligodenylate is bound to the to the hexamer, is when we reach the maximum activity of the of the RNAs. Okay, but there were still two missing questions to answer. So the first one it was, okay, is this uh, CSX1 and a specific, sequence specific RNAs? Because uh, many of the groups were proposing that it's supposed to be not really a specific. So it's just triggering uh, uh, randomly. And, and then we, we, we perform uh, RNAs uh, cleavage specifically assays. And what we saw it was that it was actually cleaving, having a specificity for cleaving in between cytidines. And the other question we, we want to try to sort out in, 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 in this study was to try to see if we could uh, also reconstruct the complex of the CSX1 with the substrate, which is the single stranded RNA. And uh, in this case, we couldn't by crystallography and, 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 uh, uh, and, and cryo EM to get the complex, but we, uh, we performed some ducking analysis and we could obtain a reliable interaction of the model of this single standard RNA with, uh, uh, with the protein in the catalytic binding pocket. So in, in conclusion, in, in related with this part of the activation of the RNAs, we were the first, we were uh, the ones uh, showing for the first time how a bacterial immune system is activated and we could map all the different changes that were occurring along this activation. And uh, well, we, we discovered analyzing uh, this uh, study that uh, the this signal system is very similar to some of them that we can find in eukaryotes. So we can find a link in between the both kind of um, uh, immunity systems. And uh, taking into account that we can modulate the action of the CSX1, we present that we suggest that probably we can use this CSX1 as a, a modular switch for it. Uh, biotechnological application. So when this was um, uh, collected in these two, two papers. And um, well, this is uh, how it was activated, CSX1. And, uh, but then uh, in, in the meantime, we were working also into trying to see how this uh, factor complex was uh, not only triggering the degradation of the single strand RNA and the DNA, but also uh, how it was producing the cyclic or, or ligodenylase, so the second messenger that activate the ribonuclease, the ribonucleases. And uh, okay, I'm not gonna be focused in, in this part of the talk because this was not my main uh, work in, in the lab, but we published finally in, in Monsal in, in 2020. And I will be focused more in the way how the CSS1 is uh, regulated because of the action of uh, some protein called renucleases. What they are doing basically, this protein are uh, basically degrading the activator of the RNAs and then are avoiding that the cell enter to the, to the cell death, so avoiding the entrance to, to an abortive infection. So when we were studying CSX1, we found uh, we could identify two different proteins acting as a renucleases in the system we were working with. It was the sulfolosis lambdico system. And we could confirm and identify these two different renucleases that were actually working as, uh, as a degradator of the, of the activator of, of the CSX1. And, uh, but not only that, because when the, the first paper came out about the description of these renucleases, the discovery of these renucleases, we started to analyze the sequences and we realized at the lab that uh, there should be two kinds of different renucleases depending on, on the length of the, um, uh, depending on the, on the domain distribution, let's say, of, of, of the proteins. So one of them belongs to the, what is called, what we call large standalone renucleases that is basically formed by a CAR domain and HTH domain. And then uh, the other one, the shorter version called small, small standalone renucleases which contains basically a uh, CAR domain with uh, C-terminal insertion. We also characterize the protein, trying to see how it works biologically speaking, and we found that it should, or should be a uh, um, uh, dimer in, in the solution. So we started to, to perform a uh, crystallographic uh, analysis with both of them. First, we started with a large standalone renucleases. And then, uh, well, uh, we finally after fighting uh, like a year with, with this crystal. We found uh, in this condition uh, a nice crystal that we could collect in, in Sweden, in Lund, in Baumax. And uh, we obtained this resolution at 
1.85. And in this case, we didn't have the problem of the of the phase problem, so we could uh, solve the structure. And this is the crystal structure of the six renoglase 0811. So this is the, the dimer, as we were expecting from the biological assembly. And then you can see here that there is uh, basically a cavity in between the two car domain that should be the, the, the place where uh, the, the cyclic oligodynamic should be bound and where the this substrate should be cleave. And this is also represented in the right part where you can see the electrostatic potential of uh, um, this top view uh, and, and the electrostatic potential uh, representation where the positive charges is representing the the uh, the, the blue is representing the, the, the positive charges. So it's supposed to be the place where the ligand is there and the substrate it should be bound for, for cleaving. Uh, so what we did it was after that uh, to incubate these crystals with um, uh, with the substrate, try to get the, the complex with the with the substrate, and we could get this. And as we were expecting, the location of the ligand it was in between these two car domain. And but for our surprise, what we found it was that the the uh, the substrate, this uh, cyclic oligodendrite, were uh, actually cleaved. So inside the crystal, it was cleaved. So what we were obtaining it was the post catalytic state. Uh, of the reaction. And this is shown by these two arrows, meaning that there were no continuity in the electron density maps, uh, highlighting this uh, this cleavage of, of the of the second messenger. And and also uh, we performed some max spectrometry essays to try to confirm that we, we have is actually this uh, um, uh, deadenylate product from, from the reaction. And as you can see here, when we include in in the system the, our protein, we were obtaining the the product of the of the reaction. So we also see that uh, if we compare the the apo uh, uh, versus the the um, uh, the post catalytic state of the protein, there were a, a huge conformational chain not only to try to adapt the the substrate in the carb domains to trying to just to trap it and to try to to cleave it, but also in the HT domain, which is in the bottom part, it was a core screw uh, movement due to the binding of, of, of the ligand. And in the right part, you can see uh, all the different residues that was involved in, in, in binding and also finally in, in catalysis. So the characterization is structural, and then we did some biochemical an analysis to try to confirm the, the key residues in, 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 in this binding and, 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 and cleavage. Uh, lead us to 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 publish this this paper finally in a couple of years ago in in nucleic acid research. So um, so this is how it was. Uh, so we did this structural basis analysis of the degradation of the of the liga of the substrate of this cyclic oligodenylate in the, the large uh, standalone renoclases, and we uh, started uh, to do something similar with the other one with. Uh, uh, small standalone uh, renoclases, so we perform crystallographic assays, and then uh, we uh, go uh, these crystals uh, that were basically like a, a phantom crystal because we we saw it like a, a hundred days after we set out the drops, and then uh, we collected the data in in, in Switzerland in Billigen. And then we obtain this uh, nice diffraction pattern and, and 2.17. So in this case, we have to uh, phase using uh, some selenometion in derivatives. But finally, we could get both apple and, and uh, complex one with the uh, substrate with CA4 bound form. And, and as you can see here also, uh, the, the, the ligand is trapped inside the, uh, the, the dimer. And the trapping in this case is different than the case of the other renoclase because it's basically excluding completely uh, the ligand from, from the solvent. So in this case, actually, it was an endothermic uh, reaction instead of uh, exothermic like in, in the other case. So it was behaving in a different way uh, from biophysical point of view. And uh, But trying to be focused in, in, in how it was trapped, this ligand, we realized that there were actually two different uh, helices that was making like an stapling for closing the gate, and they are really needed for for triggering the, the degradation of the uh, of the second messenger. And here in the in the left part, you can see all the different residues involved in in the recognition and also in catalysis and also some words because finally we got 
uh, in the case of the complex, the resolution was 1.5 Amstrom. So analyzing also the, the comparing the, the upper structure with the one with the C4 bound state, uh, we could see also the conformational change. In this case, it was uh, um, uh, higher in a sense that it was trapping, as I told you before, uh, the, the ligand in a higher way, excluding completely the, the, the ligand to the solvent. And uh, and uh, and then we we realized that it was something similar in between both, but the difference not only from the structural point of view, but also from biophysics and from from the affinity to the ligand and from the uh, from the kinetics uh, degrade in the cyclic oligodenylate were really uh, un, uh, telling us that okay, why why we need to have two different renewables for for. Um, for, for for triggering the degradation of the of the second messenger, and then finally, after doing uh, these uh, affinity assays and some kinetic assays, what we found, and it should be, or this is the hypothesis that we have, uh, that we really need to have uh, this, or the bacteria really needs to have this kind of two renucleases, and this is why they they appear grouped in in different species because it's the way to modulate the intensity of the immune response depending on the, on the different infection uh, uh, scenarios. So uh, regarding these uh, renucleases, uh, as a summary, uh, I would say that the, it's the first time we, we could, uh, um, uh, we could uh, visualize how it was uh, the activate, activation of the renucleases and how this second messenger was degraded by these uh, new proteins. And uh, we could identify these two subfamilies of uh, standalone renucleases, uh, this short one uh, or this large one, a large standalone renucleases, and the, the small uh, version of them, these small standalone renucleases. And uh, what we saw, it was, uh, I, was I, I mentioned this at the beginning of the talk, uh, we revealed that this, this uh, second messenger degradation mechanism is also followed for some phages, for some viruses, to try to escape from bacterial RNAs. So there are uh, some what is called anti-CRISPR, uh, let's say, um, protein from from phages and from from viruses that are recognizing the second messenger, then degrading it, and then is avoiding the the full response of the bacteria. But and just to to finish, I, I would like to I was basically focusing this uh, 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 CRISPR cas system as the only or apparently the only uh, mechanism of bacterial immunity. But uh, but it's not actually uh, in the in the fifties. Uh, it was uh, we discovered this. Okay, we, it was discovered the, the restriction modification systems that we most of us we are using. And then in the late eighties, it was when it was discovered the the CRISPR cas systems. And and in two thousand and seventeen is uh, when it was discovered this special type three of CRISPR cas systems. And uh, and uh, so it's let's say very recently, and all the rest or most of them that we are seeing here and I'm uh, highlighting right now are really recently discovered. So the, the, the bacterial immunity response is much more complex than it was expected. And there are many, many uh, processes that has to be dissected and understand for, for, for completing the full picture of the bacterial immunity response. And, and uh, that's all. I would like to thank all the people from uh, uh, I was working with in the Montoya group, especially the master student that was working with me, Ana Luis, uh, Javier, and Ricardo, and uh, people from the protein structure and function teams, and uh, of course, the people from the cryo team, especially Tilman Pape, and uh, the facilities and the funding for, for, for their support. And, uh, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Rafa. Um, I don't know where I am. Okay, so we stop thank you very much. Okay, good. Uh, okay. We can wait a little bit uh, because people always uh, need a couple of minutes to 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 make questions. So I have one curiosity uh, because you have said that uh, in terms of biotechnology, uh, this this system, this new system, is really uh, interesting. And, and I, I would like to, to that you share with us which are the expectatives that you think are evolving in, in this in this. Mm. 
Well, there is um, a system also based in these RNAs, which are called Sherlock system. That is also related with this trying to detect uh, nucleic acids. Uh, and basically, they are using the Sherlock system for detecting uh, viruses like COVID, for example. And, uh, and in the case of this one, it's, let's say, like a scaffold that we can use because we can modulate the response of this CSX1. So we know that it needs the activator, which is this cyclic oligodenylate. We can control the amount of the cyclic oligodenylate we can use for the activation of this protein. And then we cannot even use the renuclease as a way to control even more the, the, the amount of available activators. So that's why we are thinking to use this as a, for biotechnological application, taking into account that this Sherlock system, which is based in, I think in this case, it was uh, based on CRISPR and Cas13, which is an RNA also. And, uh, and it's uh, basically following the, the same way. So we have the different components for detecting this kind of uh, RNAs, uh, or sorry, RNA uh, nucleic acid, we can compose the, the whole kit for, for this detection. Mm -hmm. And in terms of, of controlling infections, do you think that is possible or is not so specific to, to be used as a biomedical tool? Right now, uh, I, I think it's not uh, really well known how it really uh, we can apply for that. I mean, we are in a, a preliminary state, let's say, but uh, why not? Yeah. So at the end, uh, we know right now that there is a specific cleavage in between cities, for example. And then depending on the sequence of the uh, virus, probably we can try to, to look for these ones that contain this kind of sequence, and then we can try to, to apply for those ones. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's uh, the plan. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting to have all the info structural information to, 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 to modulate these interactions and to, to yeah. Yeah. new activities. Yeah, yeah, really nice talk. So maybe Maria Jose, you have another question? Yeah. yeah. So, so Rafa, so you, you said uh, regarding the RNAs that you first talked about, so, so you, you said that in generally uh, in bacteria have a homo, homodimers uh, mm -hmm. of this protein. Um, why, why bacteria carrying these, these type three RNA, uh, RNAs need to be like more responsive to the second messenger? Is there any reason? I mean, why, why, why? Because I mean, the idea of having a an examer is that uh, uh, you can, you know, you can do well, your in, job very, you know, much efficiently. Why, why yeah. do they need that? They need that. Is there? A, well, it's not. It depends on the species. So what we have seen is that depending on the species, you have different kinds of uh, RNAs, and it, uh, they are doing the job in a different way. So uh, we have seen in in in, in Thermophilus phila. Basically, they are having this kind of homodimers, and they don't really need to have some kind of extra way to 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 cleave the, the nucleic acid or to be so efficient. But this is a kind of an evolving or an evolved version of the classical homodimer like CSM6. So, in which uh, okay, I, I don't know if you remember this um, um, feature spinner shape. Let's say in the center is the place where are confluing all different catalytic sites. Mm -hmm. So basically it's coordinating the way in a faster way in this sense. So you have in the external part, the way where the ligands are bound for the activation, but all the catalysis is in the, in the same position, let's say physically. Mm -hmm. So this is the, the, let's say like a evolved version of the, the classical homodimer from CSM's family. But I, I mean, what we have seen is that or either you have this kind of homodimers or either you have this kind of uh, examers. But the examers are the less well are understood, let's say. So we have to really deep and to try to see if there is uh, another kind of combination. It could be that there is something extra uh, like oligomers with different uh, numbers of, of, uh, of, uh, of these uh, proteins. But uh, to, to date, what we know is that there is just this kind of um, homodimers and these examers uh, that is supposed to be like an evolved version of, of the, the previous one doing more efficiently the way. Okay. So, yeah. I have a second question, and this is more technical. So, so regarding your, your second uh, part of the talk and, you know, having 3.6 angstrom cryo uh, mm -hmm. uh, map, uh, you, uh, you were not able to, to model? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
we so were actually you, why so so why why you get i mean i mean i can imagine that it was a big effort you know to you know to use those faces and and try to to get the the the, the structure at 2.9 and mm -hmm. so i mean where did you found where did you find uh you know with this half armstrong uh, extra resolution and and why well, first, it was it was worth it yeah yeah, yeah it was worth it because in the cryo em map um okay i show like a lo local resolution map i think in the talk and uh, there are certain parts, especially in those ones where all the catalytic parts are in the same place, which uh, the resolution was higher. But then in the part where it was recognizing the ligand in the upper part, let's say in the external part, the resolution it was not really 3.62. So the 3.62, it was the overall resolution. Mm -hmm. But in those parts, we couldn't really see most of the uh, loops that was involved in, in sensing the, mm -hmm. the, the ligand. So actually, if I remember well, it was something like five point something mm -hmm. Armstrong in this part. And mm -hmm. also most of the, the loops that they are not really well folded from the secondary structure, we couldn't see the continuity of the map. Mm -hmm. So we really need to go back to go to uh, X-ray data uh, to, to see those parts that was much better, probably because of the packing of the, the crystals for all the reasons but that basically we, we we have to combine both because it was the only way to have the full picture so mm -hmm. it was not possible in the other way and uh, yeah and now i have another another technical yeah, yeah. question <laughs> and this has something to do with those 100 days that uh, you were waiting for your you know to crystals yeah. for your crystals to appear what happened there what <laughs> was chopped off i mean <laughs> What we were thinking is that probably the construct we were using at that point, it was not the, the really well one for or the good one for, for solving or for having uh, the crystals. So I think um, there were like a C-terminal part of this protein that was degraded along this time. And that was the solution for getting those crystals. But we didn't really realize that it was uh, necessary to chop off this part for obtaining the crystal. We just set up the drops. We were thinking that it should be easy to, to get it or more. Okay, you never know in crystal therapy, of course, to, if you are going to get the crystals. But we thought it should be straightforward. And uh, and it was really, you know, and in between we were dealing with other proteins and then uh, we realized that we got the crystal uh, 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 100 days after. But, uh, but yeah, yeah, it was because we didn't... Uh, took the time enough probably to really analyze what was happening there. And, 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 and after we really realized that it was because of the cancer, it was not the real one. It was like 20 amino acids in the C-terminal path that was needed to be removed for, for having it. So we had to, after obtaining the crystal, we have to dissolve the crystal and to see by uh, mass spec if what contains the crystal. And then it was what we realized that what we have, it was just the, the first part a step, this C-terminal part. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. He was lucky. <laughs> well, it's, it's work, not, not, not only the, the no, no. time, no? Many, many, yeah, and experience, no? It's difficult, no? This, this part of the work is really difficult to, to, to find the conditions, no? Yeah. It's mm -hmm. yeah. in a time frame that, that uh, let you work uh, enough. And it's so, so necessary, the activation as the deactivation of the complex, no? So in terms of uh, the necessities, because mm -hmm. uh, when the RNSs are activated, uh, finally the, 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 the cells are going to die. If, uh, it's like in uh, eukaryotes, uh, that the yeah. inflammatory response needs to be controlled. It's exactly yes. Yeah, yeah, that's why it's necessary to have these renoglases, because at the end, what is doing this RNAs, so if, if we think about the full picture, we have this effector complex, which is degrading partially, let's say the invading uh, nucleic acid, and then it uh, produces this cyclic oligodenylate, which is the activator of this secondary part of the bacterial immune response. So it's triggering the rest of the response. And this second part of the uh, response is to degrade in a thinner way the, the RNA, basically, mm -hmm. in the case of the RNases. Okay. But if this is done without control. The problem is that the cell enters directly to, to death. So, mm -hmm. so it's basically an abortive infection, then the cell death, and, and, and it's not progressing. Mm -hmm. So that's why it needs to, to have this kind of renoclases that is controlling. And when it's not really necessary to, 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 to continue doing this chop off of the RNA, it mm -hmm. enters 
then degrades the cyclic organelle and then stops the function of this CSM6, uh, CSX1 uh, protein. So it's really need to, to, to have this fine tuning. Yeah, yeah. And also, this is why it needs to have both, or this is why we are proposing. We are still working on that, but why is necessary to have both? Probably is because there is this combination of different affinities, different activities uh, in the cell are working for managing the different situation in, in, in different scenarios of infection. So no, and it would be really uh, interesting to know the regulation of this, uh, especially yeah. one or, or the other, depending on, on the situation. Yeah, that's the uh, one of the remaining questions that we are on, on that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. So Thanks. We will have questions from the audience. No, no. Okay. So, Maria Jose, if you want to. Okay, so thank you very much to uh, the audience uh, meeting up today. Uh, and thank you to our speakers. And I think that we see each other again, like uh, in a year time or something like that, right, Mark? Yes. So, so hope to so hope to see you at the next congress uh, in Zaragoza. Mm -hmm. So, um, I really invite you to 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 submit a. A abstract for oral presentations and posters and I will be very happy to you know to if you want to contact me to to, to try to uh, build up the 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 meeting I'm more than you are more than welcome mm -hmm. okay thank you very much Rafa thank you Carmen also thank you. for the very nice discussion and also for the fantastic talks and thank you for uh, my Jose for organizing together with Carlos this this uh, webinar and see you in the next webinar of the same thank you see you bye bye